first, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. And hello, everyone. Welcome back to Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. There it is. I'm not going to lie. I've been watching this a lot. This is that volcano that is erupting in Iceland right now. That is a live shot of that happening. Pretty impressive right there. And uh, we wanted to talk a little bit more about that, but really kind of comparing it to the Northwest. So again, Fox 12 Now, we're live streaming on our Facebook page or YouTube, on our website and our apps. So thanks for joining us for the conversation. And, you know, we live in a zone of volcanoes, but how does that compare to the one that's going on in Iceland? What are some of the differences? What are the, some of the things that we should be thinking about? To talk about all of that, joining us right now, we have Liz Westby, who is from the USGS, a geologist who's joining us here. Let me get up my shot here. I, I created this one just so we could have it right there next to us for a little bit showing it. Uh, Liz, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Greg. It's great to be here. This is amazing. I've had this same shot up on my computer all morning. It's wonderful to, to be able to see this live. Yeah. How does this, how does this feel for you, you know, being a, a geologist and working for the Volcano Observatory and all of that? Like, what's the feeling for, for everybody in the organization? Oh, it's generally really, it, it's very exciting. First of all, this seems to be a well-behaved eruption at this time. It's not like it's threatening people's homes or infrastructure. It's happening out on the peninsula. So it's just amazing. And to be able to see what's going on, it reminds me so much of Hawaii. And here at the Cascades Volcano Observatory, we often help our counterpart, which is the scientist at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. So we've got to experience eruptions in Hawaii. And this looks just about exactly like what those eruptions look like. Mauna Loa, we just recently had our anniversary, the one year anniversary of the eruption that began November 27th in 2022. So uh, this, is, this is really quite an amazing experience to be watching this. It I never think gets that, old, in other words. I just want to tell you, it never gets old. <laughs> I bet I bet it doesn't. I mean, this is pretty impressive. And quite honestly, I don't even know how they got this, this camera set up exactly for this. It's pretty pretty amazing, this shot right there. Uh, but you mentioned that this compares to comparing it to the Hawaiian volcanoes. So can you tell us, just for a little bit of education, you know, what type of volcano this is? Sure. Um, so Iceland is on a hot spot. So that is very similar to... Uh, Hawaii, that's also on a, a, a hot spot versus here in the Northwest, we're on a subduction zone, but that, that's a little bit different. But some of the features that you see in Iceland are very similar, like what's going on right now, you can see that it's erupting in a series, in a, in a line, and this is called a fissure eruption. So uh, you can see that the, the lava is kind of coming out in this long stream. A lot of times people think, oh, it's coming out of a central vent, it should be round, but it's also possible for lava to be erupting out of this chain. And so it's erupting right now. It's uh, typically really hot. Uh, eruption temperatures can be 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's extremely hot. It will start to cool as it starts to flow away from the volcano. But you can see a lot of incandescence or that brightness out on the horizon. So a lot of that is still remaining hot. So this is very similar to Kilauea and Mauna Loa. And so I'm, I'm looking at this right now, too, and just taking a look at, you know, you mentioned the, the line there behind it. So that's all lava that's flowing, that's flowed out of that and then is kind of remaining there in the background. Is that right? Yes, that is lava. So you can two, you can see the two uh, erupting vents right now. The one on the right hand side sort of a, looks like a little more of a dome going on. And then you can see a larger eruption off to the left that looks like the, the fountaining heights are a little more uh, extreme than this one going on. And it's I don't know the heights of them right now, but it's not uncommon for them to be 50, 60, 70, 100 feet tall. So it, it's quite amazing. That's a good reason for people not to get too close. I know a lot of people want to get close, uh, roast marshmallows or hot dogs. Please don't try and do that. This is very hot. This is very dangerous. Uh, don't try that at home. And uh, yeah, definitely don't, don't try that, as enticing as that may seem. Uh, so, but the, you did mention, you know, everybody's evacuated around this area, so it's, it's as safe enough, it seems like anyway, for, for that aspect. So is this something where we could see, you know, the kind of explosion that you would see from, like we saw with Mount St. Helens, or is that not going to happen with this? This is a little bit different. You know, we do have the, let me tell you a little bit about the, what you might call the flavor of lava coming out. 
this is a basalt eruption. There are different flavors of lava, you know, based on how thick and viscous they are. This is a basalt eruption. So it tends to be hot. It tends to come out fast and there can be a lot of it. We've seen examples of this down in central Oregon. Uh, if you go down there, you see cinder cones, you see lava flows if you go down by the Deschutes River. So we do see it here in the Pacific Northwest. In fact, uh, if you look around you in the city of Portland and you're wondering, well, what's up with Mount Tabor and Rocky Butte and some of these other high points uh, that you can see from Portland, those are actually very similar types of lava that erupted. They're part of what's called the boring volcanic vents. The boring volcanic field is not named because it's boring. No volcano is boring, first of all. <laughs> Coming from someone who studies volcanoes, nothing is boring. It's named because some of the first deposits were located over the near the city of Boring, Oregon. So that's why it's called the Boring Volcanics. So the, they started erupting about 2.6 million years ago. They're considered to be... Um, almost extinct, you know, they're definitely dormant, probably extinct right now. Uh, if you ever travel up into the Columbia River Gorge and you go to Beacon Rock, that's one of the last features of the boring volcanic field. It was a, it was a vent that erupted about 57,000 years ago. So that's really the last part of it. But how cool is it to have volcanic features in downtown Portland? That is really interesting. I mean, and, and Mount Tabor, you know, just that being there, it, so you mentioned it's probably extinct, but not necessarily extinct. I did, I did catch that in there. Uh, geologists, we have these huge timelines. So we think in terms of hundreds of thousands, millions of years when it comes to volcanoes, it's most likely extinct. We certainly don't see any activity uh, and, you know, no seismicity, nothing that would indicate that this is an actual, um, a very active volcano. So we tend to think it's extinct, but you know how geologists, we don't like to say never until never, until we see never. <laughs> All right, I feel comfortable enough with that then. Uh, okay, I can go with that. Uh, but so that, I think that's really, really fascinating. So this is something, you know, just seeing this actually happening in real time, in real life happening in Iceland and knowing that that happened here, like that, kind of similar along the lines to that. That's, that's really, really interesting. So looking at, um, you know, the other volcanoes that we have here, how do they compare to, to this, like say like Mount Hood and Mount St. Helens? So Mount Hood and Mount St. Helens, we're here on a subduction zone, so it's a little bit of a different tectonic setting. Sometimes it's a little harder for magma to reach the surface, so it tends to cool a little bit more. We tend to have this more thick and viscous magmas, these andesites, these flavors called andesites and dacites. And so they don't tend to erupt very hot and they don't tend to flow very far. They tend to simply pile up around the vent and build these domes. And it doesn't mean that they're not hazardous. These domes can collapse and create these hot masses of gas and rock. So it's not without their hazards, but we just have a slightly different hazards here in the Cascade. But you know, some of the similar monitoring techniques that are used in Iceland are used right here in the Pacific Northwest. You have probably been tracking the activity in Iceland and how they've been detecting this intrusion. They can see that from space using this satellite imagery to see the deformation going on on the surface and all of the seismicity. Those are the same techniques we use here to track our magmas. And so uh, we're pretty confident. We have lots of stations around the volcanoes that if something were to happen, if some of our volcanoes were to reawaken, we'd be catching some of the earliest signals. We probably would see increased seismicity. We might see some ground deformation. We might see changes in the gas emissions going on. So we have stations tracking all of that. All of the data comes here, right here in our observatory. Uh, so we are monitoring 24-7 just to make sure uh, we're on top of things. How much notice do you think that you would have if one of the volcanoes around here were to maybe potentially erupt? Yeah, that's, you know, I can't say some, I can't say with any specificity. So this uh, eruption in Iceland had, what, a couple of months. Um, when the, when Mauna Loa erupted, there was three years of increased seismicity. So it can depend. When Mount St. Helens reawakened in 1980, there was two and a half months of renew, of steam blasts and small magnitude earthquakes. And so we had two and a half months of warning before the 1980 eruption on May 18th. And then Mount St. Helens erupted again in 2004 to 2008. We only had two weeks. So we have quite the range here, which is 
part of the reason that we are also doing Volcano Awareness, we have Volcano Awareness Month in May, and we do outreach and education. We just want to make sure that people, you know, when they're going up to ski at Mount Hood, they realize, ah, you know, I'm skiing on an active volcano. And just understand, you know, now all the volcanoes are at normal background levels of activity, no reason to be concerned. Now is the time to go and enjoy them and just keep that in the back of your mind that, you know what, they can reawaken sometime and we might be able to experience that in our lifetime. Well, and with the observatory there, you mentioned how many different ways that that you monitor this. And I imagine it's changed quite a bit from 1980. I, I would think the technologies, you know, changed along with that even from 2004. So. Uh, how many, I guess, stations do you have on there on, say, using Mount St. Helens, for an example, and, and how, uh, like, how accurate is that data that you're able to collect? Well, Mount St. Helens is one of the most active, so we have uh, quite a number of stations on both Mount Adam, or Mount St. Helens and also on Mount Rainier. We have about 20 stations within like 12 miles of the volcano. We have some close up near the top. We have some a little further away, so we can collect data on all flanks of the volcano to figure out if something's going on on the north side or the south side or a little bit further away, and we can um, figure out the significance of some of these signals. So that's kind of our, I would say, maybe our gold standard. So if you, you know, if if you were in charge of the world for one day, how many stations would you put? Twenty is a really uh, is a really good bet without making it so crowded up there. We have to share the volcano with other people, obviously, with skiers and hikers and campers, and so we don't want to um, have all sorts of stations around there. So we need to share. Well, I, I appreciate those being there, though. That's it's important. It's important that that's happening for so many reasons. I mean, and then looking at it, you know, from the standpoint, and I want to emphasize that you just mentioned that it's not very likely. Everything seems very, you know, okay in it, within the normal range right now, as you said. But say it were to get outside of the normal range, and we anticipated, you know, if this were to happen, a very big eruption on either Mount Hood or Mount St. Helens. Are there plans in place for potential evacuation zones and where this would actually go? Yes, there are coordination plans. So we, as the U.S. Geological Survey, we don't make decisions about evacuations and the plans and where people go. That's part of the county. And we work very closely with the county, and they are the ones that are going to develop the plans and procedures for evacuating people. We are the ones that are going to tell them about what's going on at the volcano, what they might expect next, so they can make good decisions. They can make good, actionable decisions about what they need to do based on what we're telling them. So we really work together. It's a, it's a really good, it's a good partnership. It's not just USGS telling people what to do. It's USGS working with county officials, working with emergency managers, working with the local communities so that they know what to do and they can take the right actions too. So we're working just to get information out there so that you have the full information. That's great. I mean, I guess one other question here I have just for this one, since we were talking about the Iceland one, do you have an anticipation of how long like this, this will be erupting or is that something that's kind of up in the air as well? Well, it's a little bit up in the air right now. Early on, it's going to be very intense and very vigorous. And so oftentimes what will happen at a fissure eruption is they will follow a pattern of this initial fountaining that has lots of gas um, and, and it typically will settle down into maybe a little bit more of an efficient eruption. Oftentimes that line of uh, lava coming out will focus down onto one fissure and then from there, um, they, depending on what's going on in the subsurface, things can quiet down from there. So I'll just give you an example. Mauna Loa erupted for two weeks back in 2022. So uh, it could be a two-week eruption. Kilauea in 2018 uh, was erupting for about three or four months. So I, I really can't tell you, but some of the geophysical signals that uh, the scientists are looking at can tell you a little bit more. They'll tell you, uh, for example, is magma still moving up? Do you still see a lot of earthquakes? Is the ground still deforming as magma is pushing up? That can give you an indication that there's still a lot of magma down there that is pushing up from depth. But if they start to see the ground kind of deforming, a little subsidence going on, a little bit of deflation, not as many earthquakes, the pressure has been, rele has been released and it's reduced, then it can only be, maybe it's only going to be a short eruption. So I really can't tell you, particularly in these early days, it's just this dramatic eruption for the first couple of days, maybe three, four days. It's just this amazing thing that people just need to sit and watch and appreciate.
From a distance, of course, from a distance. <laughs> from a distance, that's the important part. Yeah, definitely that. I do think it's so fascinating just how much, going back to the, the technical, just the measurement side, you know, how, how efficient you are at even measuring just, you know, if the ground is swelling and all that different data that you can get. Just curious on your end, as, as you know, a geologist studying this, what is your favorite, most recent advancement when it comes to the technological observing of these? Some of that has to do with the ground deformation and the ability to start measuring just changes that are essentially the width of your thumbnail. So we're talking things that are just really small, but if you have enough stations out there and they're in the right places, you can measure this deformation. And that's what's really amazing. You know, when you take your GPS out and you're gonna go travel someplace, it will oftentimes tell you that you have arrived and you're looking around saying, wait a minute, I'm nowhere near where I need to be. But uh, that's a different kind of a GPS and we're using much more sophisticated GPS to get that measurement, you know, that width of your thumbnail, we'll we're able to tell what's going on. And then you couple that with other things like we have more seismometers that are able to detect a little bit deeper and provide a little more information. So then you start coupling that advance in ground deformation with advances in seismicity and how we read things and analyze things and then gas emissions. And then you really get a bigger picture. It does. You can't just look at one parameter and say, ah, the volcano is going to erupt or it's going to go back to sleep. You really have to look at a lot of them. And with these technological advances, it's amazing what you can figure out about what's going on beneath our feet right now. That is so cool. The width of a thumbnail you can determine. That's that's just wild right there. Well, Liz, I want to say thank you very much for spending some time here with us too to talk about this. It's, it's always exciting to talk to everybody at, at your organization and uh, just sharing your knowledge and, and obvious excitement about, about this because it is, it's pretty exciting and we're getting to watch it in real time. And uh, anything else that you think people should know? No, that's amazing. Just be aware, volcanoes are in our backyard too. They're not erupting right now. They're at normal background levels. So go out and enjoy them and just understand that it's possible that they could reawaken and erupt. All right, fair enough. Well, Liz, thank you very, very much for joining me today. Really appreciate your time and uh, in talking about this. It's, it's always so nice. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Liz. All right. And, and to everybody who's watching, too, you know, again, thank you for joining us here for Fox 12 Now. These are some of the discussions we get to have. Obviously, if you're watching on Facebook and YouTube, you're seeing this as it happens. You're going to see those uh, end there. But we are also on our website and our apps. So lots of places to catch this show. Uh, we cover such a wide range of topics on here, and that's uh, because there's a lot to talk about. But if you ever have an idea for a segment, feel free to email me, fox12now at kptv.com. That's fox12now at kptv.com. And uh, let me know what it is that you'd like to cover. Maybe it's a, something that you saw on our regular news shows and you want to do a deeper dive on that or talk to the reporter. We can, there's a good chance we can get them on here and, and talk about that. Or maybe there's something going on in the community that you'd like to find out more about. Feel free to reach out. Let me know. But uh, we're going to sign off for right now. So I appreciate you joining me. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is